Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space. And I'm happy today to be joined by Alicia Owen, who is a commissioning editor for research methods at SAGE. And we're going to have a conversation about what kind of researcher are you? So Ali, why don't you just briefly introduce yourself? Thank you, Janet. Uh, I'm Ali Owen, and like Janet said, I'm the commissioning editor for Sage Research Methods Books. I'm based out of our London office, which is our global office, but I work with people all around the world, and I've been working on the methods list at Sage for just over five years now, so it feels like a long time, and I've been happy to be working with methods gurus like Janet for that amount of time as well. Well, if you're new to method space, before we get started, I want to just tell you that um, this is a blog community sponsored by Sage Publications, and we're interested in all things to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, sharing re your results in new and conventional ways. And you can see that at the heart of this Venn diagram, we have teaching and learning because we think that you know, whether you are a student or an experienced researcher looking for uh, some new approaches or new uh, thoughts about uh, your um, ways of teaching, um, this is a place where we hope that you will find uh, some new ideas and, you know, with the goal of, of creating some impact. So if you've watched these, you know that I um, often interview authors, um, but today I'm actually the author. Now, we are both wearing our maroon hats because we discovered in a recent uh, online event that we both had the same kind of hat. And I thought, well, gee, you know, it's, it's one thing to say great minds think alike, but, you know, we even have matching hats. So, you know, we're obviously on the same page. So uh, when you came up with this idea for a book about you know, that we, we've titled, what kind of researcher are you? Um, tell us kind of why that was uh, important and, you know, kind of where that idea came from. And I think I'll... I'll yeah, I think we can, uh, we've made the metaphor, but I will say this is unusual hat and we both pull it off well, so congrats. <laughs> <to us. laughs> but I, I come from a psychology and creative writing background originally, Janet, and so I've grown up with the understanding that self-awareness is a very valuable life skill and self-awareness mm -hmm. and making mindful choices is equally an important part of responsible and respectable research. And one thing that I've noticed, especially working on the methods list these last few years, is that it can be really untricky for researchers to unpack your underlying perspectives on mm. truth and knowledge, not just specific methods, and really understand how those views are informing your research practice from the beginning of your research question all the way through your dissemination and the impact you're creating. So particularly for new researchers and students starting out on their first project, this topic is something that is really useful to address from kind of day one of starting mm -hmm. your practice. Um, I wanted a book that would not just be a support for identifying those internal views that we all have, but also understanding what they mean and how they impact research. And most importantly, how you can then make ethical and informed methodological decisions based on what your perspective is and what kinds of research you're going to be doing. I think what was important for me in this book was also, and something that I reached out to you with because you're amazing at doing this, is that I didn't want it to become one of those methods books that's a prescriptive way of mm -hmm. do this, you know, follow these steps or believe in these views and you will succeed, but something that really encourages you as a researcher and a reader to think through your stance and question the assumptions that you're making, but also that other researchers are making when they're reporting research and really think critically about your research practice. Well, it certainly uh, resonated with me uh, because I think that, you know, at the heart of what we do, you know, there has to be some question about our integrity and authenticity. And to me, you know, this, it's kind of a overlaps with research ethics 
And when I was trying to do some background reading to begin this book, I was quite surprised to find that there really is not a lot of literature that speaks to, you know, the researcher kind of as an individual. I mean, there's, you know, we can find things about researcher bias. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of, you know, very specific and, and somewhat limited. So, you know, I was really intrigued by, you know, the opportunity to, um, you know, really look at, at a more, you know, robust picture. And I agree. I think it's something that I've seen too, just in looking through other books is that ethics and things like reflexivity and like you said, researcher bias are covered in quite specific and detailed ways, but taking it even a step mm -hmm. further back and really thinking about how do you view truth? What does knowledge mean to you? What does critical right. thinking mean to you is something that every scholar, not even just somebody doing a research project can benefit from. So I think right. because you have such a strong view and background in this, Janet, I guess you were the person that came to mind immediately. <laughs> and since this is partially a celebration of your hard work on this book, I think I'd like to hear a bit more from you about what does researcher integrity mean to you? Because it means a lot of different things at different stages of the process. Right. So perhaps walk us through first when yeah. you're just generally conducting right. it. Well, you know, there are a couple of points I, I think, you know, are, are important to consider here. One is that, you know, we're at this time, you know, we're in this state of the world where, you know, the boundaries between fact and fiction have become fuzzier and fuzzier every day. Uh, we, um, you know, there, we don't know, you, you know, even in journalism, you know, between news reporting and opinion and the just proliferation of misinformation and disinformation. And so as researchers, if we're going to say, oh, wait a minute, what we are telling you is different than that. Well, how do we, how do we, you know, what's the place where we're coming from where we make that statement? How do we show that we've got some credibility that's, that's different without, you know, appearing superior? Um, you know, what it, where does that come from? How do we explain that? Um, because let's face it, wherever in the world you are, you know, we are hoping for some amount of public support for scholarship and higher education. And, you know, if we're asking people to invest in educational institutions and libraries and all of those kinds of things, why should they? Couldn't they just find the answers to their questions by um, you know, looking on Twitter or Googling it, why do they need us? Well, then we need to really be thinking about, you know, how we present ourselves, you know, in the world and to the world and how we explain our work, but in a way that, that people can understand. And I, I'm not only talking about between scholarship and, and professions or practice, but even within scholarly field. I mean, I used to say, you know, and I worked at Cornell University for a while, and I used to say there were people that if you didn't have a PhD in the same exact field that they were in, there was nothing you could talk about, you know, like, I mean, they're just like so focused and, and certainly our systems of uh, promotion, et cetera, have, have, you know, pushed people in that direction. But, um, you know, I think we need to step back. And the one other, point that I want to make is that even though increasingly I think researchers do work with others and, and I would argue that there's pretty much no kind of research you can do it. You don't have need to interact with somebody at some point in the process. But there's a lot of time when you're there, it's you and your computer and nobody's watching. So you know, are you going to say, hmm, you know, this, these findings are not what, you know, like, uh, you know, this is not what I wanted to come out of this study, you know, I'm going to just put that to the side, and not, you know, I mean, you, you have it's, choices it's, to make. Yeah, so, and in a world 
where there are so many different information channels and so many different right. perspectives that you can take. It can be really tricky to identify what's inherently ingrained in you, what's coming out of your right. research and what calls make sense to call and what calls you need to question a bit more and dig right. into where that's coming from, whether it's the data or you. Right. So you mentioned working in teams and given that all around the world, there are teams collaborating on not just mm -hmm. research, but pretty much anything involving right. data. And that adds complexity in terms of involving different perspectives and their own forms of knowledge, but equally right. the way that they're working with data and the way that they're perceiving it. So how would you work on that integrity from a collaborative research standpoint? Right, so we included a section of this book on uh, collaboration, thinking about uh, working as a co-researcher, working as a co-author, and you know where the you know the needs are in those processes for honesty, integrity, um, doing what you say you will do, um, carrying through, following through on your commitments, uh, to the best of your ability, being honest when you can't when you have a limitation for, of some kind or something's going to be late. I think especially you know, when we're moving from say student life where you know, if this paper is a week late or a few days, I need a little uh, wiggle room here, you know, it's not the end of the world or I missed this class because I, something else came up. But when we get into uh, collaborating with uh, others, you know, on these kinds of projects, there the demands are, I think, a little bit uh, higher. So uh, thinking through, you know, how, um, you know, as, as you were saying, you know, what are my perspectives? What are my limitations? What are my blinders? You know, what are my, you know, I, I mean, you know, we all have, you know, where we grew up and what we understand as, you know, reality, et cetera. You know, how self-aware am I about those things so that when I'm working with others, um, you know, we can, we can really negotiate around, you know, how, not only what we are doing and, and what we want to produce, but how we are going to work together. You know, how can you become the kind of person that uh, others will say, I want, I want her on my team. I want to work with her because I know I can count on her. And, uh, you know, how, how do you become that kind of person? And that's something that's come up quite a bit in this year and everything that the world right. has gone through is how do you sort the fact from the debatable, but then also how, how do you know kind of which is which teams are holding you accountable, which right. people are holding you accountable, which people might be challenging because they're coming from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think it really comes down to communication as well, not just with yourself, not with that self-awareness mm -hmm. and, and critical thinking, but when you're working with other researchers and communicating to your audience, whether right. that's the larger public or somebody reading a journal. So how would you go about maintaining that integrity when you're putting your research out there, speaking to different people coming from different backgrounds. Right, right. Well, you know, establishing, I mean, part of it is, you know, when we're thinking about uh, academic writing, of establishing a scholarly voice, um, those are, you know, kind of practical skills that we, that we have to learn. But then, especially in today's world, if, if I read something by someone, I'm gonna say, hmm, you know, who is this person? And go look them up. And so when people do that, you know, what will they find? You know, will it support the, uh, the kind of presence you're, you're aiming to establish and the kind of reputation for being credible and being trustworthy as a source, you know, is, is that borne out? So I think in today's world, if we've learned anything from you know some of the kinds of scandals, et cetera, that you know seem to happen every other day, is that you know the we we need to be aware that things are transparent. You know, it's really hard to hide. So, uh, you know, how how do you you know really um, 
you know, build some systems of accountability for yourself um, and, and really, tr you know, try to, um, to build the skills that you'll need to, you know, not only, I, th I think today's researchers have, you know, a tall order, you know, I mean, we really, we need to step up. Um, we're needed. We need the solutions to our problems. We are, whatever it is you're interested in, we need, yeah. to, we need, we, there are problems associated Com with Complex so, social problems. Yeah, the we need problem, researchers to solve them. <laughs> you know, we need real, we need real, you know, um, help. So, you know, if you want to be a part of that, you know, so to me, that's, you know, it, this question of the, that we pose in this book it really ties into every aspect of, of the research practice. I mean, it's what you're doing when you're working on uh, your computer with your data and what you're writing and working with others and when you're communicating with the public. And, you know, how do you say, well, I'm going to be the same person through all of those uh, stages and uh, really try to be um, honest and authentic in my in the ways that I communicate. And maybe this is a developmental process where I need to get some feedback from others, you know, because I'm I'm new to this. But I think I hope that this book will give people, you know, something to think about, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how they might move forward. It's certainly a great book that also just can sit by your desk and give you that reminder to keep asking yourself those mm -hmm. questions. Because once you establish what your stance is, that doesn't mean that it can never change or that it will apply the same way in every right. situation. Um, so I think it's important to have your own accountability. But like mm -hmm. you said, Janet, take opportunity to seek feedback from others. You know, we're not all perfect all the time. Uh, and we need that kind of assistance from the outside view mm -hmm. to learn more about where we're coming from. And I think you mentioned about sometimes, even if you're working with other people, it ultimately comes down to you sitting in front of your computer. And I know from my own experience too, that can feel very isolating. And particularly mm -hmm. if you're a student working on a project, you know, you're very time poor you're working really hard for whatever grants or resource access you've just been given. What, when you are thinking back to your kind of early career researcher stage, mm -hmm. what was the one piece of advice that you received or that you ended up giving someone that really resonated with you in terms of how do I become mm -hmm. a respected researcher? How do I not cave to just kind of doing whatever the glossy shortcut version is to get right. through this project? Right. Well. There were a couple of pieces of advice that I received from my mentors. And luckily, you know, I had some amazing mentors when I was at that kind of developmental stage. One was, and, you know, it always sounds simplistic when you're, you know, not in the situation, but, you know, I mean, it was, it was, you know, one of the first projects that I did and there was some real, like, mm, this didn't exactly work out. And the person said, you know, if you don't if you don't fail once in a while, then you're not you're not trying hard enough. You know, you're not doing something new. I mean, if you just stick with what you know you can do, you know, fully and uh, completely, then you know you're not innovating. So that really freed up my thinking right there. Then another from another mentor, um, I think the best mentors reflect back to you, you know, characteristics about yourself. And I'm someone with, a, you know, very eclectic interests, which, you know, at that point, you know, you might be thinking, well, I'm going to have to, you know, let these things go and be focused, focused, focused on these things. And, and this mentor was really reflecting back, now, Janet, you know, you have a unique uh, perspective that, you know, because I have the kind of big picture but also the practical get it done. And he's like, you know, this is great. And so, you know, it helped me to say, okay, you know, these are, I need to, rather than thinking, well, there are some characteristics about who I am that I need to set aside as a researcher and as a, as a scholar and an academic to say, no, you know, em embrace these things. It will make, you know, to really look at your own unique characteristics. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a, a question that I hope as people are looking at this, what kind of researcher are you to say, you know, bring bring your your whole self to it, you know, all your experiences in life, 
will inform maybe not every single project, but the, but how you how you how you look at things and being able to you know embrace your identity. And then the final piece of advice I receive, which you might uh, think <laughs> I've taken very seriously, which is if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. Basically, this was someone who was you know elderly. The point that I encountered him. Is really, you know, looking back on his career and on the work, rich work that other colleagues of, of his had, had done and kind of, you know, if we don't have a record of it, then, you know, once you're gone, it's, it's, it's forgotten. So uh, I think, you know, it really encouraged me to uh, look at the importance of writing and uh, certainly that's something that I've been uh, very active with. Um, it's the researcher's definition of, you know, if you go to brunch and don't take a picture of it, did it even happen? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> but I think that that the idea continues to resonate me more with each year. So I hope that people are able to keep returning to your book and really thinking about how their stance is now, how it might shift, how mm -hmm. I really like the point that you made about bringing in different parts of you because I think it's very easy to pigeonhole yourself Mm -hmm. in anything in life and it's not necessarily about saying like this part of me is wrong and this one is the one I need to believe in but it's about identifying all of that package and understanding mm -hmm. how it impacts the way that you're thinking and understanding how to work with that right. but and, and I, I think one of the ways that that message has uh, uh manifest in this particular book and in some of the other uh, things I've been working on is that you know, we talk a lot about the importance of critical thinking. And, you know, we really need that. And it's certainly, you know, part of the researcher role, I mean, a big part of it is being a critical thinking, thinker, being authentically curious. I mean, you really are saying, I want to know, even if the answer is not what I expected or what <laughs> I hoped for, I really want to know. And I'm going to, you know, take that analytic mindset, but that we also need the creative thinking. Because, you know, how do, how do we come up with new solutions? How do we come up with new problem solving uh, approaches if we can't think creatively? So, you know, to me, part of the self-awareness and looking at, you know, where are your strengths? You know, maybe your strengths are in one or, or the other, and that's fine. You, you know, you've got your developmental edge, you things you can work on, but you're never going to, uh, uh, you know, accomplish everything. So that's where it ties into the collaboration piece. You know, if I know that, you know, for example, anything to do with numbers, you know, it'd be better if I brought in someone else, you know, to help me because, you know, that's just not my strength. And, you know, maybe I could learn it if I had, you know, all the yeah. time in the world, but I don't. So, uh, you know, where are the places that, you know, by being honest with yourself, you see um, the, the need that you have for, for others and, uh, and for learning? Yeah. And there is that cliche that I think it's 10,000 hours makes you an expert in anything. Um, I don't believe that that's research based <laughs> or evidence based, but it just goes to show that there's no way we could all be experts at everything. And that's where it really comes in to involve other perspectives and think about the larger context of your work. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about this series as a whole and where it's going? Because this, oh, this book fits in with a larger series. And as you can see, I'm glad that you have meant your copy. To be concise. You could pick it up and, and take a quick look. It's not yeah, a this, dive to, to, to gain some new insights. This series has been a really fun one to work on for me because it's so different than kind of the larger methods textbooks that I'm used to working on. And I think it's because they're almost polar opposites, but with the same mission and that they are still very methods focused. But each of these books focuses on one particular issue and usually kind of a this is a common methods problem that people run into, whether that's prepping for a stats exam on probability or whether that's 
thinking through your research question or understanding how to present your research, each one is tailored to be a very specific topic and get you from kind of A to Z in that topic. It's not meant to be a solve all, it's not meant to be the comprehensive mm -hmm. guide, but it's something that you can write in their activities and by the end you will come out of it with some actionable piece of your research or mm -hmm. an identity of some kind. So in Janet's, by the time that you get through, you will have an idea of what kind of researcher you are and that you'll understand your perspective a bit more. You might start to identify places where you will need that developmental mm -hmm. edge or bring in other people. Um, Janet has also worked on ones around social media data and online research. And that's something that I think we've seen a lot of people interested mm -hmm. in now, um, but really they cover research projects statistics and working with data. So pretty much the large themes of research all across the board. And I think the fun thing for me has been seeing the journey of the series grow from just you know five mm. books in 2018 to where we are now a couple years later. And originally I thought that these were going to just help undergraduates who had just started learning a methods course. But actually what's been really validating is watching all of the postgraduates and even experienced researchers mm. thinking creatively and thinking like, actually, I've never done this type of method, or I've never done this in my research, let me, you know, get up to speed with this quite quickly and see where I can go. So it's been great to see people of all stages of their research career, engage with them and kind of find the ones that work best for supporting their research journey. Great. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, be with me today. And thanks uh, for having about me. this particular book and the, the series and, and some of the research issues people are facing today. Yes, and hats off to you on good writing and a good video, Janet. <laughs> Thank you.